Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and uh, I want to apologize for the slight delay. Uh, we ran into multiple technical issues, including uh, the intro, the new intro that you saw, the countdown. Uh, it is really uh, a privilege and an honor for me uh, to have this special live stream with a dear brother in the Lord and also a professor at my own beloved college, uh, Dr. Bernie Power. And some of you probably I have watched him on uh, Dr. J. Smith. Uh, uh, he has him as a guest and he has his own also uh, teachings. So I'm hoping that you will find um, his presentation today to be extremely beneficial, especially if you have interest, of course, in Quranic manuscripts. Of course, I want to welcome all of you. Uh, I want to say uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're at right now, and especially if you are in Australia, because that's where Dr. Power is. He's in Australia, and it's afternoon already. Uh, where I'm at, it's evening. Some of you probably have morning or noon. And the other thing is I want to welcome all of you, of course, to a brand new year, 2024, and I pray that you will have a very blessed year uh, and beyond. We are so thankful for all of you, thankful for your prayers, for your support, for your partnership and subscription to our channel. Of course, I uh, will be remiss if I don't remind you to always make sure that you're subscribed to our channel, Sierra International, if you like to receive notifications whenever we upload videos. And we do upload videos on average of uh, two to three times a week, aside from these live streams. Of course, it's been a while for me to do live streams for health reasons. And many of you know of that, and I'm thankful for your prayers, of course, and partnership with us in that regard. Again, it gives me a great uh, honor and a privilege to introduce to you our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Bernie Power. Dr. Power, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And I apologize, of course, for the slight delay at the beginning due to these uh, technical issues. It's my privilege and joy to be with you and with all the listeners today. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Power, why don't you give people just a brief overview about your background, uh, uh, the minute or two at least, and uh, point them out if you have uh, a YouTube channel or a blog or anything you feel like uh, would be of benefit to them and to your ministry as well. Mm, okay. Yeah. So I've been involved in the area of working with Muslims for about 45 years now. So when I started as a, as a young man and uh, lived and worked in many different countries uh, throughout um uh, Africa, sorry, Asia and the Middle East. And while I was there, I got the opportunity to connect with Muslims and to learn what they were thinking. And then after our return to Australia about 15 years ago, I took up a teaching job at the Melbourne School of Theology, where I teach on Islamic studies. Wonderful. Um, what is it that we are going to talk about today? I, I did mention in our promo that not all variant Quranic readings are the same. And of course, I have intimate uh, you know, passion about this and intimate knowledge about what you, you're going to be sharing. But I want the people at least who will catch this at some point later, if they couldn't watch it live, to, just to get a brief introduction to the topic itself. Yeah. So on Saturday afternoon, I was out in the streets of Melbourne, where we go every Saturday to talk to Muslims and had three young men, two from Lebanon, one from Egypt. And when we talked about the Quran, they said, there's only ever been one Quran. It's never been changed. And I said, I don't think that's right. And um, so I'll be responding to that issue today. Has the Quran ever been changed? Indeed. And of course, um, I want to let people know what Dr. Power is talking about is many of you by now, hopefully <laughs> you have heard of my channel and on uh, Fonder Films, Dr. J. Smith's channel. And also if you've watched uh, Dr. Power uh, on uh, his uh, Dr. Smith's channel or on any other place being interviewed about the topic, you hear Muslims talk about variant text readings or what we call Qira'at, uh, basically. And there are uh, canonical ones uh, or uh, authorized versions, if you wish. Hafs is the most common one these days. Uh, and of course, there is Warsh and there is others as well. And what Dr. Power is saying is that Muslims, like I used to be, unanimously will tell you, oh, no, there is no differences whatsoever between all of these Qirat. In fact, someone like uh, uh, Dr. Shabir Ali would make that argument and would tell you that uh, you're not going to really... Uh, find different Qurans. In fact, uh, I remember him uh, doing even a show addressing these issues and talking about the different Quranic manuscripts and arguing that there isn't anything lost in translation, no pun intended here. Of course, our dear sister Hatun, 
is the one that brought up to the attention of many at the speaker's corner that there are variant Qurans and they vary. And I think if uh, my memory serves me right, more than 90,000 differences if you begin to make these comparisons. And we're talking differences in nouns, in verbs, sometimes in, uh, in a way that you would pronounce something. And all of these, I can tell you as an Arab speaker, can give you various meanings and some of them will have theological impact. So to say that there are no differences and they're all one and the same Quran is a little bit of a, a, a you know, basically a, a deceptive statement or maybe a, based on ignorant, if you uh, don't mind me saying something like that. <laughs> Dr. Powers, why don't you uh, uh, take us through a presentation? I think you have something for us to show examples of that. So if you're ready for that, I can go ahead and project that. Yeah, okay, so let's uh, go to the first one. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and yeah. project the presentation here. And what you guys are gonna see is that Dr. Power is gonna take us through slide by slide to make the case that not all Qurans are created equal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the uh, next slide. So the, go to the next one, please. Uh, you, you can uh, change it at the moment. Oh, uh, I can do that myself. Okay. Able, yes, sir, you will be able to do that now, yeah. Um, now it's not giving me, let's see. Uh, right. Now it's just giving me a, a frozen picture and I can't, can't change that. Are you able to go to just the slides on the left side uh, to select them yeah. one by one? When I select them one by one, nothing happens. Hmm. Okay, let me, let me remove it and uh, bring it back again. Maybe mm -hmm. that will help. Okay, and le let's try it again now. No, that's not um, the share window. Okay. All right. Now, I just removed it myself. Okay. Um, okay, and I put these up earlier. It's no problem. Uh, while, while you're doing this, I am going to give people uh, more information uh, about this particular topic uh, because it's extremely important, of course, for people to understand where uh, we are coming from. Uh, obviously, uh, whenever we talk about the topic of Qiraat, um, there is always going to be a number of issues that will arise. And that's the fact that we have different Qurans. That's the argument that someone can make. Yet at the same time, our Muslim friends will insist on the fact that there is only one Quran, despite the fact that it is called seven Ahruf sometimes. It's called seven qira'at other times and we are dealing with of course what we know as the canonical readings you have nafa that's one of the readers you have ibn kathir that's the other reader you have abu uh, Am, uh, amr al-a'la al that's another one ibn amr uh, you have hamza you have al-kisai uh, you have abu bakr asim and then you have uh, basically uh, another uh, set of uh, uh, readings as well, or readers, if you wish, like Abu Jafar, Yaqub, Al-Hashimi, Khalaf, and, and so on and so forth. And if you've been following any of the shows that either I did with Dr. Smith, Dr. J. Smith, or J. Smith doing it on his own, uh, you've learned by now that every reader has at least two transmitters, two who memorize his readings and they transmitted it. So by the time uh, we go from seven readings to 10 canonical and then four more added, that's 14, and you have two for each, you get the idea, folks, that there is so many readings out there. What is so interesting is that these readings that we are referring to now, for instance, if you have Hafs, who is uh, based on Asim, and the, you have Ibn Ayash also, who is based on Asim, you will discover that Hafs, and Ibn Ayyash, who are both the transmitters for Asim, do have variants in their reading. So how can two people transmitting from one reader still have variances 
in their own particular reading. So these are the things that we will be addressing. All right, uh, are we ready? Uh, no, look, it's not um, letting me do that. Um, and I'm not sure why. I uploaded the slides and it's telling me they're there. And when I go to present slides okay. from my right computer, now. Okay. I think I think I can change them now for you. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. If you do I'll it from ahead, I'll do that now. So right. go ahead. Yeah, it'll, it'll mess up the um, the graphics, but we'll have to no cope with that. Okay. All right. So next slide. Yeah. All right. So here we go. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this is the claim that the the one version came from Muhammad. It was um, written down, and then that universally accepted text has been recorded and passed on. And so what we have today is exactly what Muhammad as Muslims claim, heard from Gabriel. Next one. Um, and a version, uh, people like this one, this is a booklet on Islam from Abu Dhabi. It says no other book can match the Quran. Not even a dot has been changed. No variation of text can be found. But if, if you even go to different parts of the world, so wherever you go around the world, you can find exactly the same Quran. Next. Uh, and I decided I would test this. I've lived in a whole lot of Muslim countries, as so places with uh, red dots. I've vis uh, visited them, taught in them, lived in them um, for over 21 years. Uh, and in each place, I would go to a local bookshop and say, can I have um, a copy of the Quran? And I bought them. And um, this is the result. Next slide. I've got 24 different Arabic Qurans. So each one of them is different. And with a group of friends and I, over the last uh, couple of years, we've been going through them and just um, collating all the differences. Every one of those little tags there means this is different from the Hus version. Uh, this one is the Ibn Amr version. Uh, this one is um, Abu Jaffa. Um, this one is the um, Warish version. So every single one of those stickers indicates a place where it differs significantly. Now, we haven't put in every single difference because some of them are just vowel differences that don't affect the meaning. Those differences were all differences of meaning where one Quran said something, another Quran said something else. Next one. So what we're saying here, the meaning itself is different from one to the other. That mean the interpretation of it also can vary. It, it must. It must. Yeah. If you've got a different word there, then you have to have a different way of understanding why that word is there. Yeah. I want to just uh, welcome everybody who's joining us right now. Uh, uh, this is Al Fadi, and with me here, our uh, guest uh, lecturer, Dr. Bernie Power. And yes, we are live. Some of you are wondering if I am live or not. I am live and alive so far. So uh, you can ask questions. Super chat is the best way for everybody to ask, so it's I can spot it right away if you could. We're gonna go to the next slide. Yeah, next one. Yeah. Um, and the, this wasn't a new problem. It's not something that's recent. It actually existed from the very beginning of Islam. When Muhammad died, there was no authorized written Quran. There were um, ver uh, oral versions, and some people had some parts written. But as Islam spread, then in different parts of the Muslim world, different Qurans developed. So you can see up there in the top left-hand corner there, um, Ubay ibn Kaab in Damascus, his Quran had 116 chapters. He had a couple of other chapters that are not in today's Qurans. Um, uh, to the right, uh, Abdullah ibn Masood had 111. He didn't believe that El fatiha and the last two chapters, Surahs 114. 1340 were part of the Quran uh, and Abu Musa down in Medina um, we had two versions 114 or 113 chapters and there were other written versions around these ones but these were the ones which were being read and recited in the mosques around and, the, and, the and if you don't mind me adding some commentaries every now and then uh, I want to remind people that Obay and Ibn Masood according to the hadith teachings that they were the two that Muhammad always told people to go to them if he wants to learn the Quran. And the idea, according to the standard Islamic narrative, they were two of his scribes. In other words, he would receive something and at some point, almost maybe instantaneously or within hours or days, that they will hear it from him and they took the time to write it down. How can they have different number of chapters? Because today's Quran, according to Hafs at least, uh, from Asim, 
uh, has 114 chapters. And you've heard already from Dr. Power that Ibn Mas'ud, for instance, did not include Al-Fatiha, technically speaking. He didn't include Al-Mu'awwadat, which is 113 and 114. He thought those were just prayers. They had nothing to do with an inspired word that was revealed to the Prophet of Islam. Mm -hmm. When um, this uh, story went back to Uthman, he, he com uh, commissioned a committee of four people and he said, write a Quran, one for me from all the versions that are there, and then burn the rest of them. So they were to be destroyed. Now, there were two problems with um, the, the version that uh, they eventually produced. Next slide. The, the, the first one was the Arabic that, script at that time had no dots or vowels. And Al, can you read that bottom text down there? Does that make any sense to you? I mean, I, I can see the word Wahal. I can see the word Musa. Uh, you know, so I, because I'm an Arab speaker, I can make some words. But technically speaking, you have to be very careful when you're looking at it and making sure that you are reading it appropriately. But sadly, of course, many times you end up reading it according to today's reading rather mm. than let the text itself speak to you. Exactly, yeah. So if we go to the next one, that's what people have done. They've um, taken those texts and they put in the dots and the vowels and then the text becomes readable. So the um, text that's there in the orange and white, you can read that quite easily with no difficulty. That's right. Yeah, in fact, a five-year-old Arab child could read those. They're, they're very, very clear. Next slide. And the issue is the structure of the um, uh, words in Arabic. So you'll have a, a rasam, which is the basic consonantal shape, which is what was in Uthman's version. But then you add, I'm not sure you can do transitions on your slide. Go to the next one. Oh, no, okay, go back to that first one, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you can. They also have the ejam, which is the dots, the which distinguish the consonants, and then the harakat, which is the vowels. So go to the next one. In the Arabic alphabet, with twenty-eight letters, only seven of them are unambiguous. The other twenty-one are ambiguous because it could be another another letter. And so when you're writing a text without dots, then it becomes unclear which way to go. Next one. In fact, you could get a word like this with no dots or vowels uh, and then put those vowels and dots in. Next one. Uh, and come up with 30 different words. Um, so this is out of the same consonantal structure, which is what Uthman's Quran had. So he would have uh, the text with no dots, no vowels. Next one. And it will change the meaning. So you can see the in the red box, you're not sure what the person did, did they repent, did they destroy, did they represent, or who did it? Was it me or you or he or that we or they? Next one. Uh, this one, uh, it's got a, ver a noun in there. Um, if you left you this to your friend in a will, did you leave him your pipe, your house or your daughter? Dots are really important. Next one. Uh, and again, uh, what the person did, um, if you say my wife did this to the house, did she destroy it or did she build it? So it's exactly the same uh, rasam or the same skeleton, but you put the dots and the vowels in different places and you get completely opposite meanings. Exactly. Um, and Uthman's defective text actually had some problems for the people who were reading it. There was a man called Abu Zaid Umar al lahmi He was reading the Quran, and instead of reading in Surah 2, Thalik al-Kitab la Raib fihi, he read Thalik al-Kitab la Zayt fihi. That is the book uh, with no olive oil in it. And so they then nicknamed, nicknamed him Abu Zayt uh, and laughed at him every time he picked up the Quran. That's and, right. And and, and, and Dr. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Shadi Hikmat Nasser does address this at the beginning of his book. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was luckily uh, they didn't have kebabs at that time. Otherwise, he could have read Dalek al Kebab, La Zet Fihi. But both of them are legitimate readings from exactly the same undotted dotted text. Right. Next one. Um, when we lived in Oman, uh, they had some men around there who were called Mohannaths, um, uh, who were transsexuals, and they were out in the streets. I don't know, in Saudi, do these guys walk around in the streets? Um, 
No, um, no, they, they, we, we have to use the same, same term, of course, but uh, no, uh, they don't walk in the streets, but you would know about them if you have interaction with someone like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were quite open there. They would wear pink uh, didashes and um, walk around. Anyway, one of them was in the court of El Mutawakal and was asked to read from Surah 22. And uh, the verse said, Wabashir al muhbitin and he read it, well, Bashar al muhannathin So instead of um, give good news mm. to the humble people, he says give good news to the tired, to the transsexuals. And again, the text is exactly the same. Without the dots, um, it could both of those would be legitimate readings. Right. Um, there is this story, and the, the guys brought this up to me the other day, saying, "Oh well." Um, um, Allah gave permission to Muhammad to, or to his people to recite the Quran in seven ahruf. And you've got here this one from uh, Sahih Muslim. It's also in uh, Tirmidhi. Um, he said, um, uh, Allah has commanded you to recite the Quran to your people in seven ahruf, and in whichever harf they recite, they would be right. Um, now, this is great, except, uh, next slide, we don't really know him. Yeah, what the word harf or ahruf means. We know what it means in modern day things. It's like a letter um, in an alphabet or the edge of something. But what does it mean to read or recite the Quran in seven letters or seven edges? And over the years, different scholars have um, put together possible meanings, um, come, come up with somewhere between 35 to 40 possible meanings of this word when it relates to the Quran. In normal speech, it's no problem. We know what that means. And so um, at a later stage, um, Ubay, uh, Ibn Abbas and Al-Azhari and Ibn Athir said, well, it means seven dialects, the dialects of the Arabs. And we know that the Arabs at that time did speak different dialects. And so they were allowed to speak according to this view, uh, the Arabic in, in the Quran in seven different dialects. Next yeah. Time. Yet you have someone like Marian Van Putin who would argue with you that it doesn't mean dialect because he just has his own uh, idea of what it means. Mm. Yes, in fact, I'll quote from him later on. Yeah. But a later scholar, uh, Jalal Adina Sayuti, an important scholar, one of the authors of Jalal Lane, the commentary, he said, because of the growing disagreement, because people were reciting it in their own dialects, um, uh, Uthman decided that he would destroy all the not the non um, the dialects that disagreed with the Quraysh dialect, and so in his view, all of those other dialects disappeared in um, 650 AD when Uthman authorized. So that's no longer an issue because they've all been destroyed, and there's only the Quraysh dialect. So no longer can people say, "Well, we recited in the seven the seven uh, ahruf meaning dialects because uh, the dialects still exist, but the, the Qurans that were written in that in those languages were destroyed according to a sayyuti. Others might disagree, but this would be a, a common thing. That was why it was necessary to destroy these other versions. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the second problem, besides the fact that um, uh, there was a very, um, we're not sure what the word ahruf means, was Uthman's codices actually had mistakes in them. And when he was shown his first copy, he said, I can see there are grammatical errors in it and the Arabs will read it correctly with their tongues. Aisha talked about grammatical errors and other, other types of grammatical errors were there. So they picked up the, the versions that were written down by the scribes uh, from um, uh, Zayd bin Thabit and the others actually had mistakes in them from the very beginning. Okay, next one. Yeah, so so you wonder really what was the intent behind the project itself during Uthman, if that tradition is accurate or at least the dating is accurate. Was it to preserve the reading or was it just to make sure that a certain approved reading according to Uthman is the one that needs to be standardized yet they were still competing other versions of it? I mean, you, you kind of like wonder what was the intent behind it. Yes, yes. Certainly he wanted to um, uh, impose his authority and make sure that the version that he was happy with uh, was the one that was going out. That's right. But yeah, right. We point out it had mistakes, but also they had differences in them. We assume that, um, and there were 
um, according to this version, four, or sent out to four places, to Medina, Kufa, Basra, and Damascus. We'll, we'll um, test that theory later on. And uh, scholars, so guys like Ibn Ubaid, in his book, Falayl al-Quran, notes that there were 60 variants of full consonants. So remember, this didn't have any dots in it. It didn't have any vowels in it. These 60 variants were found in the, uh, in the defective, in the undotted, unvowed text. Um, so when they went out to different places, the four cities were not receiving the same Quran. They were receiving different versions. Right. Again, I want to welcome everybody who is joining us right now to this uh, special live stream about the differences between the variant text readings of the Quran. We're talking about the claim that the Quran was revealed in seven different, uh, seven variant uh, readings, and yet our Muslim friends will say they're all the same. And of course, three more canonical readings were added. That makes it 10. And then four more by Al-Shatabi uh, Shatabi were added at the later time. So we have 14 canonical readings. Yet the argument is always like when Ibn Mujahid selected those seven, almost 300 years after the time of Muhammad, somehow they all are the same, except they were attributed to a certain reader and his transmitters. And that's what our guest, Dr. Power, is trying to show you. The problem started it from the get-go, from Uthman's time and onward from there. Some of you are asking if this video is going to be uploaded on YouTube. We are on YouTube, Gideon. So don't worry about uploading it. It's already there. Great. Okay. Um, this is a comment from uh, Dr. Um, Shadi Nasser from uh, Harvard University. He says, the Quran was never a static corpus that remained unchanged since its revelation and inception due to uh, the scrupulous editing and revisions of the Quran that underwent in its recited oral form through 1400 year journey towards a final static and systemized text. And he says these variants arose because of the defective consonantal outline of the early codices. And we've looked at that. Remove the dots and you can put in any almost any word you want due to the faulty mem memory and intentional manipulation of the voweling of the text to serve legal and theological argument. And so particularly amongst the Shia and the Sunnis, even at that stage, they were disputing uh, where the vowels um, and, and dots would go. And it says, and the prophet did acknowledge variant readings during his lifetime and accepted multiple readings of the same verse. So for the early Muslims, it wasn't a problem that you were getting yeah. variations in the text because Muhammad had said this, they could see there was fighting going on amongst the Muslims. Um, and they knew that the earliest text um, was ca capable of, of variant readings. Yes, and thank you for bringing that up, by the way, uh, because uh, indeed my findings and hopefully the findings of many who are focused on early Quranic manuscripts is that the early Muslims and or early Muslim scholars per se really were not that dogmatic compared to what we uh, see today. Uh, they were flexible. Uh, they had no problem with some of the uh, variations. Uh, sometimes they even thought it was suitable for this region over that region. But yet today, of course, it's a taboo to go that far and try to make these assertions. I want to also just remind people that what you're looking at right now is a book by Dr. Shadi Hikmat Nasser, known as the Second Canonization of the Quran. And by the way, this is part of a series. That's my understanding that he's going to come up with uh, another book called the Third Canonization and then another book called the Fourth Canonization and then a fifth book called the Fifth Canonization. He's referring to different periods in the history of the Quran. And that's uh, at least the understanding that I have concerning this video, uh, this book series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, so over the centuries, Muslims started adding in the dots and the vowels and markings. But unfortunately, they put them in different places. So there had been this history of people reciting the Quran in different ways. And so, as um, Al said, some liked the, the guy they liked, um, Abdullah ibn Masud. So they put them in according to his uh, recital. Others liked um, Abu Musa. So they put them in according to his. Yeah, yeah you're talking about the verse uh, versification. The, oh, no, not uh, even um, uh, just putting in the dots and the vowels. So the, yeah, um, yeah filling up the, the, the text. Yeah, excellent. Excellent point, because uh, I see some, uh, I think those are the, uh, are these uh, versifications, these? Uh, uh, oh, no, that didn't, I don't think that came until later. You mean the numbers of the verses or the, the Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, I don't think that happened at this early stage. 
Um, That's right, because it seemed like uh, uh, even the numbering system is a little bit different uh, for like uh, Surat uh, uh, Al-Ahad, you know, uh, per se. So even the number of verses varies. And by the way, uh, people might think this is uh, a no big deal. Well, for the Quran, it is a big deal when you split a verse uh, versus leaving the whole verse intact, technically speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And particularly for those who talk about the numbering within the Quran of um, the miracles of the Quran using the number 19, they often rely on the, the number of verses and the number of words and letters. Um, by about, so this is according, and see the list of scholars I've got down there. So you've got an, an Nadim in his Fihrist of El Nadim, Ibn Jazari, um, was saying that by, by about 900 AD, a huge corpus of variant readings and system readings, at least 50 of them were circulating amongst the Muslims. So Uthman's um, plan to have only one Quran wasn't working. People were putting the dots and the vowels in different places. And so you've got 50, um, uh, Shadi Nasser says, maybe up to 75 were around at that time. So this massive explosion um, of, of numbers of the Qurans. So this was the, the first attempt, next one, uh, attempt to deal with that. Um, yeah, so the early Muslims, as we mentioned before, they accepted these. Um, they weren't too fussed. There were um, different interpretations. Some said it was a scribal error. Some said it was divine providence. And sometimes you'll hear this argument, oh, yes, um, they're because God wants us to have different um, perspectives on a word, so he provides different words. Um, but people had really no, diff no problem with the fact that these were around in, that, in those early couple of centuries. Um, they realised that the Arabic grammar rules were different in different places. There were different dialects. The script was not settled. And so um, they didn't question these discrepancies that were in there. They argued about them. And some said, oh, my version is better than yours. Um, but they accepted the existence of all of these. So, until a man named Ibn Mujahid, Ibn Mujahid came along and he said, look, this is getting out of control. Um, we need to limit this. And he chose the number seven. And um, uh, uh, Shadi Nasser says, it doesn't look like it was related to the seven Ahruf because by this time people thought they had all been, the, the, uh, the, um, the, the variant dialects had all been dis destroyed during the time of Uthman. So there was only the one. Right. But Ibn Mujahid actually had some political support. The Bag Baghdadi wazir um, Ibn Mukla um, was on his side. And so he was able to use political pressure to get his view put out there. It wasn't just as a scholar, but also as a, a politician and a lobbyist, he did that. That's right. And, and his selection was based on popularity, not yes. anything else. Like, for instance, you know, the one from Damascus or, or the one from, uh, you know, Basra or Mecca, you know. And then when it came to uh, uh, Kufa, he struggled and he ended up selecting three, actually, as a result of the fact that he couldn't find anyone that is more popular than the other. Yeah, exactly. So the next slide, it gives us a list of them. Oh, also, yeah, the first question, um, why would he produce seven? Well, it wasn't because Uthman sent out seven mushafs from, uh, uh, from Medina. If we look at this, we can see the number of uh, different manuscripts that were sent out according to these different scholars. That's them down the bottom. Um, could, could be either four, five, six, seven, eight or nine or an unspecified number. Um, depending on which tradition you read. So we're not, it's not clear that um, uh, Uthman got four printed. So again, a lot of these are pretty early. So you see the Ibrahim and in Nahai in um, eight, uh, sorry, 714, and that's Ibn Malik in 712, uh, Ibn Jubair in 714. A lot of these who were only within, say, 70 years of it, were reporting different numbers of manuscripts that had been sent out. So why do you think, brother, uh, some people, and I don't want to name names here, I know who they are, uh, they tend to like Aldani's uh, uh, report and they focus only on the four. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they ignore everything else after that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure um, because it was always a, a, a thing of... I don't think anybody ever accepted that there were only there was only the one that was clear, and I think uh, Ibn Mujahid just used his political power to get the seven accepted. But we do know that the other ones were being 
read and written in other places because they've been passed on to us. Right. Um, and these were the seven, yeah, as I mentioned. So it was Medina, Mecca, Basra. So these were, and Damascus, these were the most common ones. And then uh, in Kufa, he had the three that, that were there because there was no uh, consensus amongst the people of Kufa. Some liked Asim for one reason, some liked Hamza for another, some liked El Kisai. Um, but notice that these had all died 130 to 200 years before Ibn Mujahid. These weren't people that he knew. These were people from a previous age um, that, and he was just saying, these are the texts that I'm going to, in a sense, canonize. And just another note, just look at the ages of the people. Um, they were all relatively um, older. So 68 was a young person, but people were in their um, 70s, 80s, even 90s. Excellent. That's right. <clears throat> All right. Looks like uh, we are towards the last slide here. Oh, last slide. Okay. All right. So we need to open up the next one. Um, so I'm to get out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I did put that up. Um, so while, while you're doing this, brother, I want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please ask specific questions related to this topic. And as I said, Super Chat is usually the easiest way uh, for us to recognize it immediately. But I do, uh, I do see Protestant Believer, uh, yeah. one of our uh, uh, moderators. Uh, so, uh, brother, uh, Protestant Believer... Uh, could you point me to any question that I may have missed? I'm going to try to keep an eye on these questions. But if you can do that, that would be great, brother. Okay. They're telling me my file is too big to be presented. Um, So I'm gonna scroll just up a little bit to see if there are any questions uh, for me to remember to ask. Um, I'm gonna go all the way to the top. I do see some people who are here uh, because they just wanna troll and uh, that will give me the chance to get them out of here too. Okay, all right, let's see if I can get this up there. Um... I'm just paying attention to any of these comments. Um, uh, let me see. So Milton is saying uh, perfectly preserved, but only if you let us completely burn everything that came before it. Absolutely, that's that's a good point, Milton. Um, in fact, uh, it's kind of like a, there is a history here behind the Quranic collections. One of it is burning everything that is competing. Ibn Mujahid imprisoned others who disagreed with him and flogged him publicly. And then you get to the 1924 Cairo edition where they have to sink any uh, other uh, copies of the Quran at the, to the bottom of the Nile River. I mean, so, so there is a history here of destroying evidence and just retaining the ones that uh, will coincide with the the policy or coincide with the uh, decision making or maybe uh, there are more favorable over others are we ready brother yeah yeah sure mm -hmm. all right very good there we go okay yeah so this yeah this is the story there so a guy called um, ibn shanabuth had advocated for the readings of ibn masood and ubay ibn Kab and recited them in public and argued he was in possession of sound chains of transmission but uh, Ibn Mujahid, um, so who's in the same town uh, or in Baghdad, uh, brought him to trial, after which he was flogged, forced to repent, and pledged thereafter he would adhere to the Rasm of the Uthmani Codex. He was stripped, um, flogged, put on a, a, a breaking wheel, a Catherine wheel, tortured until he recanted and stated he would read only one of the seven. Um, so this was how uh, Ibn Mujahid used his power. By the way, um, Abdullah Ibn Masood, the same thing had happened to him when uh, Uthman told um, people who had other variants they needed to hand them over. Ibn Masood refused, and so um, Uthman had him brought down to Medina, um, and then they got beaten up and um, uh, put in house arrest, um, eventually died, um, uh, and he's before that he's... Um, 
pension was stopped and whatever so he lived in in poverty until the because he didn't agree with or wouldn't obey um the the command of the of the caliph so again it's happening now 300 years later um yeah Excellent. very good um, so here's Shadi Nasser, just to give us a, a, a perspective. So we can see when Muhammad dies, there's no authorised accepted Quran. There's um, written, some part, partially written versions, uh, some oral versions that are passing around. And then 24 years later, um, Uthman says, OK, let's codify it. And then over the next 280 years, we see these 50 to 75 uh, Qurans uh, developing and so Ibn Mujahid comes along and says no we're only going to accept seven of them so this is the second canonization right? that's right and he's gonna uh, pinpoint every step along the way so when they added three more he's gonna call it the third canonization and then when they added the four is going to call it the fourth canonization. And then the last one is the 1924 Cairo Quran. So in other words, I, I like the work of uh, Dr. Uh, Nasser because he's really uh, a brilliant scholar and uh, all he's doing is laying out the facts mm. and letting you judge it based on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now he points out that there was also contamination from the Hadith method. So the Hadith, um, people are starting to, um, or had been collating the Hadith and so he then applies those rules to the Quran. Um, so the ideas of the terminology, the moral transmission of the transmitters, corroboration weren't existed, uh, weren't in existence when the Qur'a'at or the earliest versions, these seven versions were written. But now he's saying, well, we need to apply those methods to these to make sure that these are acceptable as well, which was a completely new thought. Right. Um, a couple of words. So you might come across this word eponymous readings, which means a book that's named according to its author. So Hafs um, is the one that Hafs wrote. Qara'a is a reading um, written between 90 and 170 years after Muhammad died. And a, re a reader is a qari or a qira, uh, sorry, a qura. Um, and then the rawaya is a transmission or recitation which came after that and came from it. And the transmitter is called a rawi um, or the plural the rawa. So that you'll see those terms popping up. Next one. That's right. And, and Dr. Shadi Nasser did an excellent job in his book explaining all of these as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So the isnads, he says, were uh, uh, retroactively connected through fictitious narratives and isnads to their mythical founders, which is a pretty big claim. He says the process of isnad documentation was not utilized at the at the generation of the seven readers. Um, and these these things were added later. And as time went on, he says they became more and more sophisticated and more and more detailed, even though at the time that wasn't done. Yeah. And if I may add something related to this, like, for instance, he's talking about the idea that it's uh, retroactive here in terms of the chain of the narration itself. When you look at some of the uh, corrections that were made to the early Quranic manuscripts that were discovered by Dr. Brubaker, uh, he would argue also that those appear to be retroactive in terms of like fixing an earlier Quranic reading to match today's Quran. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very clear. You can see where they've crossed out words which didn't agree and written in a word which did. So this idea of um, attestation. So uh, uh, Mutawata a text is one which has multiple um, gen, um, lines of transmission which were independent. In other words, the people weren't talking with someone else about what they had. That's the best one where you can get uh, independent evidence from um, witnesses who haven't colluded together. But he says the fact remains that all of the eponymous readers were transmitted via single strands of transmissions between the prophet and the seven readers. And this is the least reliable form of transmission. So he said, based on the evidence that we have, there, there weren't, there wasn't multiple attestation happening through there. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to apply those um, rules of uh, integrity, Asim doesn't quite make it. Um, his uh, contemporaries and those shortly after him said he made many mistakes. He had a bad memory and he used to pass on bad um, uh, Hadith versions. 
things that had weak narrators and that contradicted well-known authentic hadiths. So they would reject him as a transmitter of the hadith, but accept him as a transmitter of the Quran, which seems a little bit anomalous to me. That's right. And there were also character issues. So hadith um, transmitters had to have a certain character and um, a positive, a good character. And El Kisai was uh, known to be a liar. He was impudent, uh, consumed alcohol, accompanied young boys. And one day uh, when reading in the mosque, he got beaten up by the congregation because he was reading a, um, an unacceptable reading, one of Hamza, which is actually one of the seven. It became acceptable from Ibn Mujahid's perspective, but um, uh, it wasn't at that time. So there were issues about his character. Um, and so Adani and Ashata became uh, later on, uh, a couple of hundred years later, and they said, seven is too few. We need to loosen up, be more accepting, inclusive. And so they added uh, two to each of those. And you can see now these are the reciters. So they came later. Um, now, again, have a look at the dates of their death. Um, these were, half of them were aged above 89. Now, you might wonder why would they need this? Because if you want to construct a chain of transmission, you have to have people going back as far as they can. And so their birth dates became very elastic. And I would imagine that these ages, not many, uh, you wouldn't get half the population living um, over over 80 in, in those times, over 90 actually it is. Um, yeah, and so we're seeing this kind of stretching of the of the birth dates as well as the biographies of these people. Another thing is that um, Aduri, he transmitted two versions. So he heard one from Ibn Amr um, and he also heard one from El Kisai. And I've got versions of both of these, by the way, and they're different, which is a problem. If you went to Aduri and said, recite the Quran to me, he'd say, well, which one do you want? Do you want the one from Abu Amr that I heard or do you want from the one from El Kisai or... Do you want my version of Abu Amr because um, his is different? Or do you want my version of El Qasai because his again is different? There's variations between every single one of them. So I said, I can give you four versions. Um, you know, which one do you want? Yeah, and so, it, this is this is really the sad state of affair, uh, uh, brother here. Um, I accept these kind of um, attestations from the normal Muslim on a street, okay? The normal guy in the street, the normal Muslim woman, you know, who really wholeheartedly believe in this. But you have scholars who are actually have no problem with this and they will go to fight uh, actually in a battle to try to prove that, yes, what you just said is possible for Al-Duri to do all of that. Yes, that's right. It's just, yeah, it's incredible. Mm. Okay, next one. Okay, so even within these versions, there's not a single version of Huff's. Um, he says, Asim's students disagreed amongst one another and transmitted his reading in different forms. And the rendition of both Huff's and Shuraba, who, who both heard the reading from um, uh, uh, Asim, uh, were different. And again, I've got both of these and I've collated the differences between these two. So you've got two guys who may be even sitting in the same room listening to the guy, to their, their reader, and they're either learning or writing down different versions of it, which is a problem. Next one. So Ibn Mujahid, he didn't have actually a copy of Asim or even a copy of Hafs. Um, so he couldn't canonize that copy. What he had was different versions that had been passed down to him, and he had to choose which one of these versions he was going to accept. So it wasn't a sense of he's just this one thing, but multiple versions that have been passed down, and every one of them is different. It's not yeah. they're not identical. Otherwise, they wouldn't have kept them. Yeah, and, and Dr. Shadi Hekmat Nasser goes through a lot of these uh, basically diagrams in his book. It's very meticulous. He goes through word by word with some of them and, and talks about the different ones. So now we've got to what he calls the third canonization. So it looks like about a quarter of a millennium seems to be the going time when the Quran comes up for a review. Um, and so we see 1,600 to 257 years later, we've now got 20, 21 Qurans. We've got the seven that Ibn uh, Mujahid said, and then the 14 that 
uh, Danny and then Shatabi after him said, so that makes 21. That's right. And I just want to ask my Muslim friends who will be watching this uh, at some point, hopefully watching it now or maybe watching it in a few hours from now or maybe later, please ask yourself, how in the world can Al-Dani and Al-Shadibi decide almost half a century later, 500 years, which one of these readings they added were actually revealed to Muhammad from heaven? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and then a Jazari comes along uh, uh, another another time, and he says, "Well, uh, seven and the fourteen is not really enough. We need to have these other ones in." So he adds in, and again, these were all from the same period. It's not as though he's adding in a Quran that was just uh, written, you know, two hundred years later. But they're all from the same period. So he adds in Abu Jafar and Yaqub and Khalif. Again, I've got copies of these um, uh, with their reciters. So he's now put in another 12 uh, versions, sorry, that's three, six, yeah, 12 versions that he's added in. Um, and here they're being a little bit uh, more agnostic about the age at death. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I want to make a correction and, and thank you, Protestant believer, I guess with my excitement, I said half a century, we meant half a millennial later, half 500 millennium. years yeah. later that that's they did right. that. I mean, even 100 years later is still troubling because who is an eyewitness account at that point? How can you ensure that truly what is preserved in, in those preserved tablets in heaven was revealed that way? I mean, what I like about the work of Dr. Shadi Hikmat Nasser in his book about the transmission of the different Qira'at is like he would really poke holes. I mean, he did it in an academic way. He didn't say it this way. These are my words. He poked holes in the tradition itself, the hadith, that says that the Quran was revealed in seven ahruf. I mean, that hadith tradition alone has so many problems written all over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so now we've got to the fourth um, thing. And now we've got, again, so we've got the same period with 237 to 377 years later, another quarter, another quarter of millennium. He's now saying, well, there are 30 ones. And what they're doing is authorizing the ones which can be read in public. Um, people still had their, their private versions that they'd been passed on uh, or people were writing about other things which had been ignored in the earlier earlier centuries. But um, so he's now pushing for these ones. This is like almost 800 years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. After yeah. the time of Muhammad. Yeah. Um, and then Dimyati comes along. He's uh, not quite as strongly attested or strongly affirmed and some muslims will have problems with this but you do have uh copies of this oops i'll just go and grab my uh, that would be accepted i bought this from the um the, the islamic bookshop uh not far from my place and this has got the 14 different versions in there which includes those ones in there so hassan and ibn muhaysin and Ilyas. Um, Yazidi would be are included in this one and again uh, they list all of the different variations so they'll have a, a verse there in the text this would be the Huff version inside the box and then all the different variations of it um, from these other 14 readers so but they're, but they're all that but they're all the same right they're all the same Quran there is no differences whatsoever it's amazing I guess my question is with a normal Quranic reader, a Muslim today, picking up that book that you just held in your hand, would they really look at it and say, oh, they all sound the same? They all mm -hmm. read the same and they all mean the same? No. And these guys were trying to tell me on Saturday, but they're just dialects of Arabic. And I said, well, what dialect? Can you tell me of a dialect where they have a different word for uh, he, he did something or she did something or I did something than another dialect. I said, it's the same. That doesn't change across the dialects. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next one. Um, and then he, uh, the, so that's the fifth canonization. This isn't uh, Shadi Hikmet Nasser. He doesn't put this one in there. He actually adds another one in it. But I thought it was important to put this in, particularly because for many people, um, these are acceptable ones. And again, you can see the timelines there in the green, 280, 257, 337, 275. Every quarter of a millennium, they decide it's time for a change. Okay, yeah, so, so basically what they're doing is, like you said, I like uh, what you said, it's time to review the Quranic edition and make corrections now because 
uh, oops, uh, this uh, really looks like it's not clear to people anymore. So we have to fix the problem. Mm, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. That was the last uh, slide, brother. Okay. Let's see if I can get the next one. Okay. Again, I really hope everybody is enjoying this. Uh, this is why I am excited and delighted to have uh, Dr. Power here with us. I'm familiar with his work. I've uh, met with him multiple times, of course, privately on Zoom. And I was so fascinated by the work that he's doing. And God is using him also in my own research. I'm so thankful for that. But I was excited when I noticed that he is also open for the idea to come on a live stream and talk about these things. So my hope is that those of you who are here and those who will be watching it later, please make sure you take good notes, you share these, uh, this video with your Muslim friends. And I'm hopeful uh, that uh, Dr. Power will join me uh, more than once uh, to talk about specific instances and examples from these variations uh, in future live streams as well. Okay, now. I'm going to uh, just take a look and see if we find any comments or any questions. I like what um, uh, Marion is saying here. She's saying it's also, uh, uh, okay, Marianne, we're not going to say the word, but it's also interesting, let's say, uh, that the uh, further they move, meaning that uh, our Muslim friends move forward in time, in this case, like you have the second canonization or the third canonization or the fourth canonization, uh, the more trustworthy reciters they are able to dig up from the past mm -hmm. and show horn uh, uh, basically into their chains of narration. I mean, it's really interesting and fascinating to me indeed. If we were to do half of this just for the gospel, you will be surprised how many Muslims are going to attack us for mm -hmm. daring to say that it's reliable. Yeah. yeah. Um, now it's telling me that I can't add any more slides, which is so you, uh, you can remove uh, uh, one oh, of I them. Can move, okay, all right, yeah, that's good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, so remove from studio. Okay. There you go. Now you can add uh, okay. more slides. Okay. Um, thanks for that. Yeah. This is where well, I'm getting to some of the stuff that I'm do been doing as my original research. So that was. Or background to give people you can upload up to two absolutely uh up to two slide decks okay please log in oh no it's telling me as a guest you can upload up to two slide decks please log in or sign up for um to upload more i'll just see if i can remove that by two you can remove the second one if you okay, want I'll remove that one um, and uh five. okay Yes, uh, that's true. Protestant believer. Uh, Protestant believer, uh, my nickname for him is that he's neither a Protestant nor a believer, but uh, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm just joking. He's a, he's a wonderful brother. And uh, I love the uh, profile photo that he has. You can handle the truth. And, uh, yes. That is mm -hmm. true. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, it's not letting me do that. Is there another way we can get around this? It's telling me you can only up upload... Up to oh, I guess it counted him against you for some reason, unfortunately. Yeah, I have no idea what to do, brother. Uh, uh, maybe maybe we'll uh, we'll do this uh, in part two. Uh, yeah, maybe we could do that because I've got, um, yeah, I'll start looking at some of the, the research and doing a comparison between the different versions. I think um, that will be a good one for uh, the next part. You and I will talk about maybe having you in a week or two from now. And yeah, sure. uh, you, you show me an example of that. Uh, what uh, Dr. Power is talking about, folks, is that he did a table and he would show you differences verse by verse, if I recall, mm -hmm. and chapter by chapter. And you will see uh, even Huffs, right? You discover that even Huffs have uh, differences between some of the copies of Huffs alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I actually compare 28 different versions. So I've got um, access to whole 28 of them and I put them in a table so you can have a look at it uh, and see and see the differences between them and see that Huffs is quite often out of sync with everyone else. Um, everybody else agrees on a certain reading and Huffs um, is the, uh, the, the dissenter. So, uh, yeah. yeah. 
Maybe we talk so about uh, before we close, uh, uh, folks, again, if you have any specific question about what you just heard, please, please go ahead and shoot it our way. And I want to thank Sean and I want to thank uh, others who gave also through Super Chat. If you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, Dr. Power, how can people who are watching this show now and hopefully the future one, how can they benefit in terms of their witness to our Muslim friends? That's my first question. Yes. Um, so often I, I carry these things on my phone. <laughs> and um, so when people say, no, it's not possible that there could be different. So I'd say, well, look, have a look at this. Here's, here's my picture of 24 different Qurans that I own. And these are some of the differences between them. Um, and people, I mean, if they don't want to believe, they're not going to believe anything, but others will be a little bit more open and say, oh, look, I'll be happy to go and have a look at that. The other thing is I did a, uh, a debate a couple of years ago with a scholar from Australia on has the Quran been changed? And I put some of this um, earlier material, not this stuff that I've been doing now or the stuff that I'll do next time into that. So that gives people a bit of a background and I'll send that out to them so that they can see that there's a, um, kind of a, a reasonable basis for this from an Islamic perspective. So, uh, yeah. Mm. Oops, sorry, you're muted now. Are you just muted yourself? Uh, wonderful. And also, uh, if you tried it already with some, have you noticed any reaction, like a really sincere reaction uh, to this as, oops, Houston, we have a problem? Yes. Yeah. Often. And typically they'll say, oh, I need to go and talk to my imam about this. Of and course. Say, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, maybe I can just, just limit, uh, to, um, summarize what we've talked about today. So we've, we've uh, ex uh, recognized that many versions of the Quran existed from the very beginning. It wasn't something that was a surprise that popped up in the second century. Muhammad had talked about these seven ahru, but nobody actually knows what he means by it and 30 to 40, uh, 35 to 40 different explanations have been um, uh, suggested for it, but nobody's really clear. Uthman decided he would enforce one version, but it was undotted and also had the versions that he sent out were different from each other, so it wasn't consistent. Um, uh, and so we had the result of a 50 to 75 different versions appearing by about 900 AD. There were multiple versions you can choose from. Ibn Mujahid says, let's limit it to seven. Adani and Shatabi uh, move it up to uh, uh, 10 uh, plus, the, sorry, um, they, they add in the Qara'ats, another 14. Ibn Jazri adds in the three to make it up to 10. Uh, and then Dimyati adds another four. So we're now seeing the number increase and increase. Um, and then we'll see next time uh, what the Muslim world decides to do about this and what the differences are between them. Wonderful. Uh, again, uh, if you can just, uh, before we close, let people know the type of work that you do. And do you, by the way, have uh, your own YouTube channel? Or do yes, you I do. Yeah, yeah. So just burn, BerniePower.com. Uh, and my, I've got my own website as well. So people and can do you talk on. about these issues in there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. if you go on to the debates one, you can see the thing there. I've also written a, an article for academia.com called The Transmission of the Quran. Um, yeah. So, yes, I do have that article, by the way, uh, and uh, thank you for your contribution, of course, to the academic field. Again, mm -hmm. folks, uh, I encourage you, of course, to go and check the website uh, by Dr. Bernie Power and also his YouTube that is named after that as well, Bernie Power. And hopefully you can share this video as well with others and share it also on your platforms. I noticed somebody is streaming it already on TikTok. I'm not on TikTok, but you are streaming it on TikTok. That is amazing. Praise God for that. I noticed that there is a TikToker that takes all of my videos and he is really ranking up views in the millions. So, so we praise God for that. So please take the work of Dr. Bernie Power also and stream it on TikTok and other platforms so people get to know about the uh, fabulous work that he's doing. I have to tell you, folks, I have enjoyed learning from Dr. Power, and I have benefited tremendously from his work. In fact, right now, he whetted my appetite about additional stuff that I will be talking to him about as, as well for my own research. Uh, Dr. Power, uh, we are so thankful for uh, wonderful uh, scholars like you, and uh, we pray that the Lord will continue to use you in a powerful way to reveal many of these things to you so that many will benefit, and especially Muslims, from these findings, and they will find the truth 
in the Son of God and knowing the Son will set them free. And that's what we pray for. Thank you, uh, our dear brother. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I promise you there'll be part two. And uh, right now, after the show, I will discuss with Dr. Power about his availability. And we will do part two and hopefully part three and part four. And we'll continue doing these things because they're extremely powerful. They're extremely damaging. And they're extremely also eye-opener for our Muslim friends. So indeed, thank you so much uh, for your work. And thank you for everything that you do. And thank you, uh, Andrea. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen you last in my uh, live stream. And I appreciate everyone for their prayers and for checking on us. This is Al-Fadi, over and out. God bless you all. Take care. Bye-bye.